Hey everyone, welcome to week 61. Today is day five, Friday. This is our last day of our one small brush week. And I think we've done well. Uh, for some reason, unbeknownst to me because I hadn't planned this, I started focusing maybe too much on the object, on the subject matter of my paintings, and I'm leaving my substrate raw. And that's kind of weird, but it's actually kind of cool. So I don't know, it's working and it feels good. So <laughs> let's see if we do that today also, but we'll see how we do today. Remember next week, new theme. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is day five. This is going to be our last day of our one small brush week. And I think the week has been going pretty good. I mean, I anticipated having to struggle way more than I'm struggling because, like I said on the first day, you know, this is something that's very foreign to me. It's very strange to paint this way. And if I have to look back, the only times I had to paint in this manner or I chose to paint in this manner were when I was working as an illustrator. And I would do it because I would have a manner of constructing my painting that would lend itself to be solved through small brushes. And I'll try to explain this a little bit. Um, when I was doing illustration work, I would try to solve my images in very traditional ways. And what that means is that I would solve my drawing first, and then I would do my underpainting, and then I would start finishing, quote unquote, areas of the painting. That was the most efficient way to try and develop an idea and to have an assurance that you were working on something that was solid. These were jobs, so you didn't want to speculate. You just wanted to solve an image that was already approved. So you wanted to be, again, as efficient as you could. Having an underdrawing and having an umber underpainting, let's say, where you have your design worked out and where you also have your values worked out, you know, your light and dark shapes, that's a great basis for any painting. So when you choose to put color down, when you choose to model forms and break them down into small shapes and start developing detail or, or whatever finish you have in mind, you know, however you want to resolve your image, having all that structure underneath just makes it a lot easier. You're not going to get so lost when you decide that you're going to break everything into small shapes. And what you want to do is pick an area and just finish it. You go for those small relationships right from the start and you want to finish everything. You start from a point in the painting and you start spreading throughout the painting. So you don't have an idea of what that painting is gonna look like when it's done, but because you have these two layers of information kind of holding everything together, you don't feel like this painting is just up in the air. You don't feel like, oh, I have no idea where I'm going. This could be a disaster. No, 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 there's enough stuff down that is gonna give you a sense of tranquility. Having that underdrawing and that underpainting is definitely something that is going to give you peace. And if you can control your colors well enough, you know that when you have those two things down, you are going to be able to develop this painting and there's not gonna be big surprises along the way. That works because we have that underdrawing, that very resolved underdrawing. It's a drawing that's been thought out, it's been sketched out. You've tried to solve all the major issues. You've committed to these shapes, to this design, to this choreography of forms, and you put it down. It would be dumb to stray away from that drawing because you've worked really, really hard to establish what it is that you want to paint. And the same thing could be said about the underpainting. You've also worked out light and dark shapes. What is that abstract rhythm that your painting is going to have? How are you going to use value to help you convey that message? And how is form turning in space? You know, what's the quality of light? How is light traveling through your painting? Those things have already been worked out. So if you have those two instances of a painting down, you're not going to feel insecure when you think of painting a small area of a painting or when you feel like you want to quote unquote finish or resolve very small areas of the painting. So that's the only example that I can think of that I've worked in that fashion, you know, starting from a very small part in a painting. But if I have to think of how I paint currently, which is the manner in which I've been painting for the last, I don't know, maybe 15 years, it doesn't really make sense to do what I've been doing for the past couple of days because it really isn't the way I think. This is not the way I understand how to solve a painting. 
You know, if you give me a house painting brush, if you give me a big brush and you tell me, okay, use this oversized brush to start with and you have bucket loads of paint, I'm going to feel at home. That's going to feel fantastic to me. So what that tells me is that if I go bigger, I'm always going to be fine. If I go for bigger shapes, bigger relationships, even bigger than what I paint usually, I'm going to feel fine. I even want to go there. Those feel like my next steps in the development of my own painting. Like that's the road that's ahead of me. I can see that as pointing north. You know, that's the direction I want to travel. But if you tell me, okay, here's a bunch of these awesome small brushes, I don't know. I feel like they don't belong to my process. I feel like they can be part of my process. You know, there's going to be a time where I can invite them to a painting and where they're going to be essential also. But they have a place and a time. But if you tell me that I have to use those brushes all the time, oof. That's very, very tough for me. I mean, in that sense, this week has been tough for me, but I think I've been almost like subjecting the brush and subjecting the paintings to a manner of resolving them that makes it a little bit easier for me to understand this whole process. And one of the things that I've done, and I think that it's been obvious for the whole week, but I think it was very evident with yesterday's painting, with the painting of Shifra, and I hope, I hope, I'm not butchering your name, Shifra, uh, because you have a Gaelic name that is an absolutely beautiful name. But like many other people in this planet, I can't do Gaelic. Um, I'm going to sound very stupid. So <laughs> you have a beautiful name. You're a fantastic model, by the way. Shifra poses in some of the quirkiest and most amazing ways. She usually shares a bunch of the uh, photos that she takes of herself in the uh, Kenya reference group. Bernie did a fantastic painting of Shifra before, and I was very scared. I was like, oh, I don't know. I can't compete with Bernie, so <laughs> I'm going to try to do Shifra the way I would paint Shifra. So like I was saying, something that's become very evident about this whole week is the isolating of the figures of my subject matter. And I'm not quite sure why I've been doing this. I mean, part of it, I think, it's just a matter of looking at all that space and knowing that if I wanted to cover all this space, it would just feel like a physical imposition. You know, it's almost like you have to paint this whole atmosphere, you have to paint all this air, and you have to do with a small brush. And I saw no point to it. You know, I don't think that that's something that we have to do. We don't have to paint in any particular way. So as soon as I realized that, yeah, I can just suggest those relationships with the background, with the atmosphere that is surrounding the figure, as soon as I saw that all I needed was that relationship, I realized I don't have to paint all of it. I don't want to paint all of it. I mean, if I painted all of it, it would make using a small brush a nightmare. And I don't want my paintings to be nightmares. I want them to be fun. I don't want to self-impose all these rules that don't really exist. I don't have to put paint down in every single inch of the substrate I'm painting on. That doesn't make sense. And I think this week has been a perfect example, at least for me, to show me that I don't have to do it. You know, this is something that is a choice. Every single thing in painting is a choice. And if you choose one particular road, it doesn't mean you're going to be right all the time, but it means that you have to make it work. Like if you commit to something, make it work. So I think this idea of isolating the figure was born from understanding that all I had to do was generate a relationship or insinuate a relationship with a background or with a space or with a sense of atmosphere. It was about being suggestive with the air that enveloped the subject matter. And as soon as I realized that I could just enunciate things, I could suggest things, I was like, okay, this is what we're doing. This is it. Because on Monday, I isolated the figure. On Tuesday, I wanted to make sure that I didn't just bump into something that was cool by accident. So I tried doing... The same thing except with an imprimatura. So I had a ground and I had an imprimatura. I used that as an atmosphere with Ferris painting and it also worked. On Wednesday with Adrian's torso, we did the same thing. Just the smallest bits of suggestion of what that background, what that atmosphere would look like when put against some moments of the figure. 
And I think yesterday, yesterday was the moment where I said, okay, let's take this idea and let's really explore it. What if this space, this nothingness is acknowledged by me? How do we paint something that acknowledges all that emptiness? And this is the hardest part, paint something in there where the emptiness doesn't feel like emptiness. This quality of something being unfinished. What if this is like a mosaic made up of little pieces, but you're missing half of them? What if this painting feels like that? But again, what if the air between those pieces also feels like something? And I think yesterday, at least for me, made it very clear that it could work, that if I treated my atmosphere as such, as atmosphere, I mean, it was empty, but I tried to give it a personality. I hope I made that atmosphere feel like it was relating to my choices, to everything that I was putting down, like I was considering the fact that my brushstrokes were going to be against that emptiness. And as soon as you acknowledge the nature of that emptiness, it becomes something. It's not just a figure floating in space. It actually has a character. And when I thought of that, I thought of Michael Bormans. I think he's a, a genius at doing that. He's a genius at isolating the figure, but at charging the space that the figure is isolated in with so much character that the space even though it's empty, even though it's nothingness painted, it's almost as important as the figure that resides in it. So it feels like a space that is there to hold, to receive the figures. And there's a small watercolor of his that I really, really like that, that are kind of conscious of this emptiness that is ahead. And in my mind, I felt that if they were to walk up against this, you know, white void, my painting, the painting that I did of uh, Shifra yesterday would be what would follow in that Boriman's uh, watercolor. You know, that's what the figures would feel like. That's what the figures would look like when they start inhabiting this empty void. And I got excited about that. In a way, it just didn't feel lazy. You could argue that, yeah, you're just isolating something because you don't want to paint the rest of the background, the rest of the space, the rest of the atmosphere. And I'd argue, yeah, you run that risk and you have to be aware of that risk. And only when you're aware of that risk, you realize that that emptiness becomes very, very important, becomes a variable that has to be solved. So I hope, I hope that during the paintings this week, you've seen me try to acknowledge the character of that emptiness. And you've seen me try to solve that emptiness. There's no kind of theatrical or literal quality to that emptiness. This is not like a set, which is very much what some of Boriman's paintings feel like. They do feel theatrical in a way, artificial, like this is a setup. And I obviously think that this is completely directed. He wants that feeling when you look at his paintings. I don't think this is accidental by any means, which actually reminds me that whenever I've heard him speak, he speaks a lot about old masters, but he speaks about high Renaissance and Baroque masters. And for some reason, I've always thought that he would start with Manet. I've always thought that if there was one painter, if there was a single painter that he has a ton of things in common with, it had to be Manet. To me, it's like really, really obvious. I think it has to do with that sense of theatricality and how that space, that, you know, quote unquote empty space is given a very specific, very certain character. And I think Manet was unparalleled in doing that. Even when he paints elements in the background, they are completely disconnected. So for example, in one of his most famous paintings, the, the bullfighter lying on the ground, I don't know if you guys know this, but there used to be a bull in that painting. And it was very small and it was way in the back in the horizon. But the thing was, the uh, people started saying that the bull, this very menacing bull that was in the background, because it was so small, because he was pushing perspective so much, it looked like a mouse. So it looked ridiculous. So he actually cropped the painting. And that's why we have this super weird horizontal composition that was not common at all. Even for like late 19th century, that was just not something that was common. So I think Manet is able to, you know, conjure up this very strange, quirky relationship between figure and space where even though he does paint this atmosphere, 
it's this atmosphere again of nothingness. There's a physical quality to this atmosphere, to this space that these figures are inhabiting. But it's nothing. It's almost like spending so much time and so much effort so this atmosphere becomes almost invisible. And that's masterful. That's not a waste of time. It's actually quite the contrary. It's a ton of work done so, so well that you don't even perceive it. I think that that's pretty amazing. So I've always found the connection between Boromans and Manet to be very, very evident, very obvious. And even though what I'm doing is completely different because it's just about embracing this idea of this floating subject matter in this nothingness and hoping that I can relate both of them well enough that they make sense as a painting. I realized that these are fantastic painters and indispensable when I'm trying to understand the character of the relationships that I want to construct in my painting. So their work was very, very helpful. And I think for today's painting with uh, Danny's portrait, it was almost like going back to the first painting I did of Emilia and saying, okay, this is something that I recognized the first day. Let me give this another try in my last day, and let's push this idea of air. It is not air that is isolating the figure. It is air that becomes environment. It becomes atmosphere. It becomes space. It even becomes form in certain moments of the portrait. So to make that work, I think it's not easy. You have to be very, very conscious of what you paint and what you leave out. And every single choice matters. Every time you put something down, every time you decide not to paint something, it matters. It matters tremendously. The weight of these brushstrokes is enormous. And I think it's quite beautiful because, you know, this is a tiny little brush and suddenly it started weighing a thousand tons in my hands because I realized that what I love about painting is just the responsibility of mark making. And I think that was very, very present during the whole week in these paintings. So I love that. Everything that can remind me that choices matter, that when you go and search for something in your palette and you pick it up with your brush and you put it down in a certain fashion in your painting, it matters. It's a way of saying things. These are the words that make up the message of your painting, so they have to have weight to them. I felt that obligation. I felt that sense of responsibility during this week, and I loved it. It started out as a painful, because it was painful. I can tell you guys that it's not fun. I mean, I'm sure there's a ton of people out there that do paint with a small brush, and they kind of got used to it. And I don't know if it has to do with the pain that I've been carrying on my wrist, but I, I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy that part of it. I didn't enjoy the physical part of it. Even when I watch myself painting in these videos, I can see myself twirling and twisting the uh, brush all the time because I'm trying to find comfort in these brush strokes and I'm not at all finding them. So as a practice, I don't think this would be something that I would do constantly, but I think that as a way of pushing myself to gain consciousness of something that is very important in my painting, I'm completely fine if I do it for one week. So that's going to be it for this week. As we say on Fridays, Danny and I and Samuel Fed are very grateful that you guys grant us the opportunity to be your company for, you know, a couple of minutes a day. And we hope that we can continue to be your company during next week. So we'll see you guys next week. Again, we love you. Thank you. Bye.